You'd think after recording all these videos for YouTube that teaching by video live from the lab to students would be um, easy or satisfying. It's not, it's still a pain. Oh well, uh, students are back. We're back in the lab, we're doing things. Here's another video. Today we're gonna talk about, how did the patella get round there? Um, we're gonna talk about our synovial joints. These are the joints in the body that give a wide range of movement. And um, I'm gonna talk about the general structure and parts of a synovial joint. I'm not gonna talk about the various different shapes and classifications and that sort of thing. This is very much how you make a, a, a synovial joint. I probably will talk far too much about articular cartilage because I used to be an articular cartilage biologist before this job. Uh, in fact, during part of this job as well. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about osteoarthritis because that is the main disease of uh, the synovial joint. Yes, I know rheumatoid arthritis is a big thing as well, but indulge me, osteoarthritis used to be my, my thing. Um, okay, so uh, a synovial joint is a joint that allows a good range of movement or a lot of movement. So some joints in the body, think about the sutures of the skull, allow no movement. And some joints allow a little movement. And some joints allow a great deal of movement. So the synovial joint has a number of structures within it which make that possible. Um, it's, a, it's a joint that's mobile, but of course it has to be held together because it's also mobile. So there are a number of challenges in here. And essentially, we have um, the ends of bones. Here we're looking at, at the knee. So we have the femur and the tibia. And the bones themselves tend to be shaped in such a way so that they articulate in such a way so that the, the knee, for example, is a hinge joint. It, it does rotate a little bit, but generally it doesn't rotate. It doesn't make any other significant movements. It, it's a hinge joint. Now the bone is covered by articular cartilage. The um, whole joint is surrounded by synovial capsule. We've got some cling film for this. And that creates a potential space. And inside that potential space, we have synovial fluid. And all of those things combined give us uh, a low friction joint, which in some cases is very good at withstanding compressive loads. That's it in a nutshell. Did I do a nutshell for once? That's, that's unusual. Okay, so if we look at the knee joint and forget the patella, now what we can see here really is probably the bone and the cartilage has been stripped away. Certainly that's what we see when we look at a skeleton um, because the bone survives and the cartilage doesn't. So this looks nice and shiny, um, but articular cartilage then is it's like hyaline cartilage, blue tape. This is going to be, this is going to be articular cartilage. The articular cartilage then covers the articulating surfaces of the bone. Wish I'd chosen better tape now. You know, maybe actually once I should actually rehearse something that I do instead of making it up on the fly. But who's got time for that? Okay, so I'm just gonna do one surface, something like that. But, so the, the articulating surface of the bone, and you can see that it actually curves all the way around, so it's not just the bit you stand on, but it's the whole bit that you move. Anyway, articular cartilage covers the articulating surface of the bone. And articular cartilage is made up of largely type two collagen, like hyaline cartilage, there are other collagens involved, like type 9 and type 11. Coll uh, collagens that help manage the fibril diameter of type 2 collagen and also link those collagen fibres together. So what you get is kind of like a mesh weave bag of collagen in your extracellular matrix in your cartilage. And then also inside that articular cartilage, we see proteoglycans, particularly agrican, 
with lots of glycosaminoglycans. Now what the proteoglycans do is they pull in water and hold on to water. There's lots of hyaluronan in there. Um, and what you then got is you've got a mesh bag holding in all those proteoglycans, holding on to all that water. So you've got a material that is then very good at withstanding compressive loads and it does deform a little bit. Um, and you also produce this very smooth, friction-free articulating surface so the joint can move smoothly and easily. Um, inside the articular cartilage, there are cells maintaining that extracellular matrix, all of those collagen proteins and proteoglycans and what have you. And those cells are chondrocytes. And there aren't very many chondrocytes. They're spaced out inside the extracellular matrix. They, um, they sense the, their surroundings and they react to changes in their surroundings. So, for example, you know, the, the chondrocytes will manage the extracellular matrix. They'll, they'll, they'll make the collagen, they'll make the proteoglycans and what have you to make sure that the articular cartilage is, is healthy. And there's a balance between the rate at which the articular cartilage breaks down and the rate at which it is repaired. And normally that's kept in balance and you have good, nice, thick, healthy articular cartilage. And in fact, the chondrocytes are very good at responding to load. So there's an old wives tale that, you know, runners will wear their knees out. This isn't true. Um, there's lots of evidence, lots of studies that show that in fact, runners have very healthy articular cartilage. So the cells respond to the repetitive loading and they make thicker cartilage. They make better cartilage to respond to that, just like your bone responds to load, just like your muscles respond to load. Um, the trick comes when there's an imbalance in the joint and then you get very, very high loads in one area uh, where you wouldn't normally expect very high loads and that causes problems. Here's a cool fact. Articular cartilage has no nerves in it and it has no blood vessels in it, which means that pain from articular cartilage degeneration must be caused by another component in the joint and it means that the nutrients must get to the articular cartilage through another route and the metabolites must be taken away similarly. Hmm, I wonder how. It turns out articular cartilage has a progenitor cell population in its surface. So when you lose the surface of your articular cartilage you lose those progenitor cells that can make more chondrocytes. So that's an issue. Anyway, articular cartilage. Right. Um, the synovial capsule surrounds the joint and completely separates it from everything else. So the synovial capsule um, it's actually made up of two layers. It's got an outer fibrous layer, so it's a, you know, it's a fairly tough capsule um, and it's continuous with the periosteum covering the bone. Um, and it has an inner serous layer. And that inner serous layer is largely responsible for creating synovial fluid. So when you look at diagrams in textbooks, you tend to see that this is all pulled apart and there's a gap between the two bones and what have you and there's a big, big blown up synovial cavity. That's not what it actually looks like. There's no gap between the articular cartilage of the tibia and the articular cartilage of the femur, of course, those two are pressed together. And the whole thing is wrapped in this, encased in this synovial capsule. So then the potential space that's inside there is filled with synovial fluid. So the space in the joint, it's kind of, it's more of a potential space than a real space. And there's only a little bit of synovial fluid in there. Um, and this is input. So the synovial fluid is a lubricant and you need the synovial capsule then to keep all that in place. Otherwise your synovial fluid is just going to leak out. And it's not going to work. Do you see? But maybe, maybe it's the synovial capsule and the nerves there that cause some pain. Anyway, um, but the synovial capsule is sometimes thickened in places, forming ligaments, helping to hold the joint together and keeping it stable in whichever way it needs to be stable. Um, and in some places it's thinner. So synovial fluid then. So inside here, if you were to pierce through the synovial capsule, synovial fluid would leak out and it would be very, um, very, very oily. Like it's, it's a very good lubricant. It's very, very slippery. And I know this because I've, I've done this a lot. I've taken um, 
bovine joints apart to get the cartilage and culture the cells and, and do various research. And I've got, I've got a very nasty scar on, on that finger where um, I slipped when I was dissecting because the, um, the synovial fluid, once you've pierced the synovial capsule, it, is really, it makes everything really, really slippery. It's a lubricant, it's viscous, um, it's got hyaluronan in it and lubricin. It's the synovial fluid inside the synovial capsule, which is responsible for carrying nutrients to the articular cartilage and carrying metabolites away from the articular cartilage. The other thing to remember here is that the chondrocytes of the articular cartilage, they're not very active, they're not very busy, so they don't have a great metabolic requirement. Um, but that's the synovial fluid. Apparently, synovial fluid is also a non-Newtonian fluid. You know, like custard, right? The rate at which you load it affects its mechanical properties. If you load custard slowly, it's, it's fluidy. If you load custard hard, it becomes hard. If you load it fast, it becomes hard, right? Um, <laughs> uh, rheologists will explain it much better than I did. But, so, so I think the synovial fluid can also um, be involved in resisting compressive loads. But those are the main important components of a synovial joint. The articular cartilage, the synovial capsule and the synovial fluid, they all work together with the specially shaped joint surface to give you a freely mobile, smoothly articulating uh, joint, which you can't take for granted until they don't work anymore. And that's the challenge here, isn't it? is creating a joint that's freely mobile, maybe restricted in one or two ways, but also strong enough and stable enough to stay in place. Uh, if you're making a fixed joint, like a suture in a skull, that's pretty easy. But with synovial joints, it's very difficult. If you think about the glenohumeral joint and the wide range of movement there, because that joint is actually very shallow, it then becomes a real challenge for the body to hold this heavy upper limb into the glenohumeral joint as you move it around. So, so it's, a, it has a, it's a joint with a wide range of movement, particularly when you add the, um, the shoulder girdle into it, but it's also quite a weak joint. Whereas the pelvis, the hip joint has a kind of uh, a, a reduced range of motion, but it's a very strong joint. And the knee is somewhere in between the two. Um, the knee has to take all of our body weight um, and so the synovial capsule running around it is strengthened by ligaments, but the knee also has, it has ligaments running from bone to bone outside it. It has ligaments running from bone to bone inside it, the cruciate ligaments. And then it also has all of the muscles. Think about all of these muscles that cross the knee joint. Um, they have, they're big muscles with big tendons because they have to raise our entire body weight, but also the muscles themselves are very important in stabilizing the, the knee joint. So if you have a knee injury, it's really important to consider these muscles and are they balanced and are they strong and what have you, right? So muscles and ligaments work together to stabilize the knee joint or to stabilize any joint and hold it together. And the other thing we see in the knee is we see these menisci, now a meniscus is a, like it's a fibrocartilaginous. It's not like high, perfect hyaline cartilage. It's a bit more fibrous than that. Um, and this is kind of like a semicircular disc that is because we've got these articulating surfaces here and this disc is um, kind of thin in the middle and thicker outwards. And the wedge then helps stabilize the joint even more. So you need all these things to work together to have a, a good stable joint. And what we tend to see is that it's not um, wear and tear that causes osteoarthritis. It's when a joint is not square anymore, when it's not loaded normally. Um, and osteoarthritis is a degenerative disease of the articular cartilage within the joint. And um, it has a hereditary aspect. So there's a genetic component to it. And it's also associated with, um, with, with people who, um, you know, work moving with manual work and that sort of thing. Um, kneeling down, spending a lot of time on your knees is bad 
uh, is likely to cause osteoarthritis and degeneration of the articular cartilage. So it's not running <coughs> that wears out the articular cartilage. It's when you've had that injury, if you had that tweak or imbalance and you start loading the cartilage inappropriately and one bit has a high load, then you're likely to damage the cartilage. But what we see in osteoarthritis is, I said there was a balance between the degradation rate of the articular cartilage and, and its repair, its restoration. It's when that gets out of balance and there are a whole bunch of pathological things that happen here. But the rate at which the cartilage is destroyed is greater than the rate at which the cartilage is repaired. And we see some changes in, in the cartilage as well. So over time, the articular cartilage gets worn away and it may get worn away all the way to the bone. <sighs> for decades, well, we, we, we've been saying for a long time, oh, in 10 years time, there'll be, a, there'll be a method of fixing this because there are so many potential treatments out there. But it turns out it's a really hard biomechanical problem to solve. And still, I think the best way of fixing it is to actually replace the whole joint with a prosthetic joint. Um, which is what the orthopaedic surgeons do. My dad's had his hip done. My dad's got osteoarthritis, so I'm likely to develop osteoarthritis as well because of the hereditary component. And it's not just in the big joints, it often starts in the thumb and the fingers and other joints around the body. Um, and so what's the currently recommended treatment for osteoarthritis? It is keep using the joint. Not my recommendation, this is, this is the British, this is the NHS the nice guidelines, this is the, the recommendation. Keep using the joint and manage the pain. Because if you keep using the joint, um, then it seems to, well, the cartilage seems to last for longer. Um, of course, when you the thing about these synovial joints is, is that when they stop working, they, they cause a whole bunch of other problems because they limit people's activity. And when you limit someone's activity, not only does it have a knock-on effect to their working life, but also to their, to their weight, because people will usually put on weight. Obesity then causes exacerbation of osteoarthritis. And with obesity, of course, we have all these other health problems as well. So with osteoarthritis, it's really important to try and help that joint last as long as possible and also to stay active for the rest of your body. But that's it, the synovial joint is, is those structures. Osteoarthritis is a disease of the articular cartilage. I did, didn't I? I talked too much about um, articular cartilage and osteoarthritis. That's still pretty good for me. Um, anyway, right, okay. So, a <laughs> uh, synovial joint, which incidentally is also known as a diarthrodial joint, is made up of articular cartilage, synovial capsule and synovial fluid. And it gives a, a freely moving, low friction, um, joint. All right. Okay. Uh, so when you're looking at any joint in the body, right, lots of these things, consider the shape of the joint and the synovial joint, how it, how it's structured around it, how it might be injured um, and that sort of thing. All right. Good. See you next time. Mm -hmm.